Before we begin, we'd like to thank the members of the AJC family who generously sponsored the participation of young leaders at this year's Global Forum. We're so grateful to be here, and you have our sincerest appreciation. Yossi, you have written extensively about the state of Israel diaspora ties and have a very personal connection to this. What are some of the key challenges today, and how can Israelis and Jews around the globe work to strengthen our shared bonds? So, uh, Francis, delighted to be doing this with you. you. And uh, hi, everyone. It's really great to be back with the AJC. I've only been involved with the AJC for about 30 years. <laughs> and uh, writing and speaking and, uh, you know, you've, you've really been, been blessed with, with the Jewish world's best leadership over the years. And that tradition is continuing with Ted. So I'm just delighted to, uh, to be here. So, um, Francis, when, when we think about the, the increasingly complicated nature of diaspora-Israel relations, um, when, uh, when I was growing up in, in the U.S., in the American Jewish community of the 1960s and 70s, uh, Israel could do no wrong. And we didn't want to look at the fine print because Israel was the Jewish people's miracle child. And there was too much at stake. Israel was the emotional and even mythic counterweight to the Holocaust. The Holocaust had just happened a few decades before. It was still a, a, living, a living wound. And so, for understandable reasons, the diaspora really didn't want to look too closely at the fine print. And now, of course, as the relationship matures, we're much more aware of, uh, of the difficulties that each community is facing. These are the two seminal Jewish communities of our time. And before looking at the, the fine print, before looking at the problems, I think we, we need to begin with, by celebrating this moment in Jewish history that we're living in. This, to my mind, this is the most extraordinary time in Jewish history because we have, on the one hand, the most successful expression of Jewish national sovereignty that we've ever had, and I'm including the Davidic kingdom of 2,500 years ago. This is by far the most powerful, the most influential expression of Jewish national sovereignty in history. And at the same time, we've seen the almost simultaneous emergence of the most self-confident and most powerful diaspora in Jewish history. And so before we look at the tensions, the inevitable tensions, we need to really start from that place of owning the, the privilege, and I use the word privilege in a very positive sense, uh, the privilege of being Jews at this moment in our history. So, the, the difficulties are inevitable. We, we have very, very different experiences as Jewish communities. Uh, the, um, the Israeli experience is to live in a region which until recently, and it's changing now, but until recently the region was almost uniformly hostile to our existence. And that included the very formal, formalistic peace treaties that we had with, with Egypt and Jordan, which were really kind of uh, extended ceasefires. And now we're in a new era, and it's going to take us some time to adjust to that. But for most of our history, we were in a region that did not accept our existence. And so the natural tendency among Israelis was to respond with deterrence to our surroundings. In America, the Jewish community, as you all know, experiences quite the opposite uh, dynamic, which is you are embraced by your surroundings. And so the Jewish community has wisely devised strategies of, uh, of openness, of flexibility in your Jewishness. And, and the starting point for a, a necessary realignment between Israel and American Jewry is recognizing the very different 
and necessary strategies that each, each community has, has devised in relation to our, our surroundings. What worries me about this moment is, and this I see as really the great danger that we're facing in the relationship, is that what holds, what has held the relationship together uh, is symbolized by the two flags on the bima of most American synagogues. And what those two flags represent, to me, is the commitment to a Jewish state and to democratic values. That, I think, is what those two flags are communicating. What's beginning to happen in both communities is a, a, a growing challenge to the, the necessary entwinement of those two values. In Israel, it's being expressed, as we see before us, with a rising anti-democratic sentiment, which is no longer just confined to the fringe. It has now been brought into the heart of the Israeli government. And that's on the one hand. And that is a, a, a growing part of the Israeli public, still, thank God, a minority, but growing, that is looking at democratic norms with deep suspicion and sees democratic norms as antithetical to our ability to defend ourselves, which is a very dangerous opposition. In the American Jewish community, as you all know, the, the danger there, and so far I think it still is confined to the fringes, but also growing, a questioning of the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state. How is Jewish and democratic, how can they be compatible? And I feel that what our generation's job is to affirm the, the, the essential connection between Jewish and democratic, and it's not an easy connection, and we, and we need to stop fooling ourselves. It's, it's, it's a very difficult meeting point between these two non-negotiable commitments. Israel, in Israel, that is not a Jewish state is not Israel. And for me in Israel, that's not a democratic state is unrecognizably Israel. And this is what we need, this is what we need to affirm. So. Well said. In February, you wrote an open letter with journalists Mati Friedman and Daniel Gordas about urging North American Jews to, stand, to take a stand against Israel's proposed judicial reforms. You said that diaspora Jews have both the right and the responsibility to speak up. What was the response to your piece, both in Israeli society and abroad? So um, maybe I'll, I'll preface my response, Francis, by, um, by noting in passing the coincidence of appearing right after Minister Shikli. <laughs> and, um, and I'd like to just respond very briefly to two points that he made. The first was he, he claimed that this government was elected by an overwhelming majority. In fact, there were a few thousand votes that separated the two blocks. This applause is one of the reasons why I love AJC. <laughs> so let me give you some applause. And the second point that he made almost in passing, almost to himself, I had to ask myself if I'd really heard correctly, is he called those Israelis who were demonstrating in New York and around the country against him in particular, but other government ministers, he called them BDS activists. Now, I happen to personally know many of those people, and in the last months, I've been working with that group. And my appeal, and I'm going to say this in, in the most uh, restrained way that I can, my appeal to you, Minister Shikley, is to stop defaming the loyal Zionist opposition. <laughs> and now to your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, 
this was, um, I, I, I think it was in February that um, Mati Friedman, Danny Gordis, and I uh, wrote a joint uh, open letter to you, to the American Jewish community, the community that we come from and that we've been, we've been engaged with for, for many decades. Uh, you have been my principal audience, uh, the American Jewish community, really for, uh, for 40 years since I, since I moved to Israel 40 years ago. And, and the same is true for Danny and for Mati. And we've never done anything remotely like that letter. I never dreamed that I would be writing an open letter to American Jews to protest my, against my government. I have never protested against my government. Uh, I have opposed policies left, right, and center. But I've also voted for governments left, right, and center. In the past, I have voted for Netanyahu. And I voted for the Likud more than once. And today, I regard this government as a moral disgrace to the Jewish people. And the response that we received to our letter was overwhelming gratitude, beyond anything else, just simple gratitude. As if American Jews needed permission to, 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 to speak out. And I say as if, because I don't believe that you do need anyone's permission. This is a moment that has in it tremendous positive potential. First of all, in Israel, we are seeing the rise of liberal, patriotic, centrist Israel. This is something, and, and this de these demonstrations are not coming out of the left. This is something that I think needs to be emphasized. There are certainly parts of the, the left is involved in the demonstrations, and I'm very pleased that they are. But it's my camp, the camp of the center, that is really leading these demonstrations. And if you look at the symbol, what is the symbol of the protest movement? It's the Israeli flag. Now, if you think about the American context, and I say this with a great deal of pain, because in the American political context, one side of the debate has essentially appropriated the flag and patriotism. And here, that has not been allowed to happen. And, the, and liberal Israel has found its voice, has found its determination, and is no longer amorphous in the way that I think a center tends to be. Liberal Israel is fighting for a liberal definition of democracy and a liberal definition of a Jewish state. And I want to just briefly explain what I mean by both of those. A liberal definition of democracy is that democracy is a dance, a complicated dance, between the rights of the majority and the rights of a minority. This government sees democracy as winner take all. And we hear this over and over again. The Supreme Court is a non-democratically uh, is a non-democratic institution. Who elected you? The job of a Supreme Court is precisely to be a counterbalance, protecting the rights of the minority from a potentially overreaching majority. In terms, <clears throat> in terms of a Jewish state, we also have here a very deep disagreement between the liberal camp and, and this government. The liberal understanding, liberal Zionist understanding of a Jewish state is that Israel is the state of the Jewish people, period. Whoever we are, the whole mess, whoever we are, full Jews, half Jews, quarter Jews, and that's embodied in the most radical Zionist law on the books, the law of return. The law of return goes far beyond the reform movement's patrilineal definition of, of Jewishness. The law of return welcomes into Israeli society. It isn't technically a definition of who is a Jew, but in practice, it brings into Jewish Israeli society anyone with a single Jewish grandparent. 
and you weren't married to a Jew, for that matter. And, and certainly anyone converted by any denomination. And so, <clears throat> this government does not see Israel in quite that way. The, for this government, which is the first government that I would call, not in name, but in practice, an orthodox government. This is the government of Judaism. This government believes that the state of Israel is the state of Judaism, and not Judaism in its broadest sense, one part of Judaism. The next big battleground is going to be over the law of return. This government intends to begin contracting the definition of who is eligible for admission into Israeli society. Now, when you ask me, Francis, about the, the relationship between diaspora and Israel, this is the issue. Israel as a Jewish state, Israel as a democratic state, by a liberal definition of both those, those identities. Because what's happening today, it's a very complicated moment. Because on the one hand, we have an emergency agenda. And that agenda is we have to save the court. And it's literally that. If we hadn't been out on the streets every week for the last six months, we would have a, a, an override in place where the Knesset would be able to veto any decision by the Supreme Court with a simple 61 seat majority. That has been stopped because of the protest movement. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what's about what's happening here. Um, okay, I would like to ask another. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So, can this, I ask you? Oh, this, continue, this, sorry. this fight, this struggle, is not just mine as an Israeli. This struggle belongs to the whole Jewish people. And I would urge you all, <clears throat> the people who are outside, who've been outside through the Global Forum demonstrating, are not demonstrating against the Global Forum. They are inviting you to join with us to defend a liberal, expansive definition of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And, um, and so I see this moment as a tremendous opportunity for us to deepen the relationship, to take us to the next level, to the maturation of the American-Jewish-Israeli relationship, where we can be together in the most difficult issues. And there's nothing more difficult than a threat that's internally generated. We all know how to deal with external threats. We've been magnificent, the two communities together, in dealing with threats that come from outside. How do we deal with threats that come from within? And how do we deal with those threats without creating, God forbid, a schism among the Jewish people? And it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. On the one hand, I feel this tremendous anger and, and fear, a sense of, of protectiveness for Israel. On the other hand, the people who vote for this government are not my enemies, and they're certainly not deplorables. <clears throat> they, they are my partners in building and defending this country. And after this is over, after this is over, we're going to have to figure out how we begin healing this wound. But first, the first order of business, the emergency agenda, is to save Israeli democracy. Amen. As young Jews, we have seen and experienced the rise of anti-Semitism worldwide, including in our communities within the United States. 
In your view, how can the global Jewish community respond effectively to growing anti-Semitism while also promoting understanding and allyship among different religious and cultural groups? So I think that AJC is a model in doing exactly that. And really, and, and there's, there's no one who does it better than all of you. Building alliances on the one hand, and, uh, and, and standing up for Israel. And the, 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 the dignity with which AJC carries the, the, the Jewish story is really something that I think is a model for the Jewish people. So thank you. <clears throat> the, the challenge that we're facing now is that what's under assault is the credibility of the mid 20th century Jewish success story, both, both in Israel and in American Jewry. We went, <clears throat> as a people, from the lowest point in our history in 1945 to what I believe is the peak moment in Jewish history, which is today. And the enemies of the Jewish people want to undo that success story, see that success story as illegitimate. In Israel, they want to turn the return to Zion into a crime, into one of the 20th century's great crimes. Yasser Arafat used to call it history's greatest crime, uh, rather than one of human histories, never mind Jewish histories, one of human history's most inspiring sagas. And in America, you're facing a different but in some ways similar challenge to the American Jewish success story, which is seen as somehow vaguely suspect. There's something in the American Jewish story which is, is coming at the expense of other, of other people, of other minorities. And we need to own the extraordinary achievement of the generation that came before us, the generation of the Shoah and of the return to Israel, that bequeathed to us the, what I think is the most uh, extraordinary story of Jewish survival in 4,000 years. And that's what we're fighting for now. We're fighting for the legitimacy, for, uh, for the right of future generations to be proud of what we achieved. <clears throat> and the way that, that I would, the way that I, I, I frame this for myself is that we need in the 21st century to own the identity of being a survivor people. And by survivor people, I don't only or even primarily mean the people that endured the Holocaust, but the people that survived the Holocaust, that overcame the Holocaust. And I say that as the son of a survivor, but really as the son of, of a survivor people, because this is the great Jewish story of modernity. It's our story as a survivor people. And that's the story that's under assault, and, and that's the story that we need to defend together in Israel and in the diaspora. Thank you. In Lyft, we recently read your acclaimed book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor. You highlight how narratives surrounding the Israeli-Palestinian beliefs, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, um, often differ significantly with deeply held beliefs and historical perspectives shaping both groups' views. What steps do you believe are necessary for Israelis and Palestinians to rebuild trust, even, if the, even in the face of past grievances and skepticism? Look, I think that first of all, there's no short-term solution. And I say that with, with a great deal of angst. Uh, there will be no solution anytime soon. And I think we all know that. On the other hand, we need to be engaging in long-term peace building. Long-term peace building is a very slow process. 
it begins, first of all, within Israeli society, between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. It extends to the region to strengthen the Abraham Accords and expand the circle of the Abraham Accords and, and take advantage of this, this unimagined gift that we've received in the last few years. I think one of the most significant developments in, the, in Israel's history and in the history of the modern Middle East. And finally, and I've left the Palestinian issue out for last, because I believe that that will be the last. But if we can strengthen coexistence within Israeli society, and if we can strengthen the Abraham Accords, we will be creating a kind of cushion, an envelope, that will allow, possibly, for us to re reopen the, the, the two-state track. And, and my, my hope is that there will be a combined pressure from Arab Israelis within and the Arab world without on the Palestinian leadership to begin to finally making its peace with the legitimacy of the Jewish return home. And that's, <clears throat> that's, one, half, that's one half of the work. The other half of the work, and this is work that I have as an Israeli citizen, is to ensure that my government doesn't sabotage possibilities for a long-term solution as well. Thank you, Yossi. Your stories and experiences, have, and experiences have captivated our attention and encouraged young leaders to strive for excellence and positively impact the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tadarabha. Tadarabha lachem. Thank you. Thank you.